Okay, so I'm going to go through the Q&A, and I just want to point out that uh, we are going to have to wrap things up pretty close to one hour here for this session, so I'll get to as many of these as I can. Uh, beginning with, uh, why does the publisher have to be volatile? Um, that's actually uh, a pretty good question. We tend to use volatile um, keywords on anything within Java just based on the Java memory model if you're going to be sharing that dependency. So even in the case that you're setting something, a setter injection, uh, we want to make sure that different threads are going to be able to see that when it's been modified, that reference itself. So that's the reason that we use volatile. It, it's, it's just plain uh, Java at that level. Um, can the schedule be made more dynamic? Say the cron expression is in a database. Actually, that is possible in a number of different ways. Um, what I showed was using a property placeholder configure, and then the properties were in a property config file. But actually, the property placeholder support within Spring has its own abstraction for property loading. So what you can do is configure property placeholder and reference properties loader, and that can be retrieving the values for those properties from a database. Um, so yes, that is, that is possible. I should mention, um, in a similar vein, the Spring expressions that are used within the Spring integration components, those expressions Instead of putting the expression directly in the config, you can reference the expression by its key using a sub-element. And the key, as well as a source, that you want to look up that key. And then you can plug in an expression source implementation. So those expressions are coming from a dynamic source, whether it be a file that's reloaded similar to the way the Groovy scripts are, or a database where you're sharing these expressions. Um, and that's another way to add the um, you know, dynamics to your application. Okay, the next question is, what is the concept of exchange in the new Spring 3 messaging framework? Um, and I guess that is probably relevant to when I was showing the um, AMQP example, so I just want to clarify. Exchange is part of the AMQP messaging model. Exchange is what the producer sends to. You can think of an exchange as being something that's relatively static, that lives in the broker, and does not do any buffering itself, but instead simply routes to queues that are bound to it, and then those queues are responsible for the buffering. So when I was talking about an exchange, I was specifically talking about the AMQP exchange. Um, did not see any published subscriber buffered. Is it not supported? No, actually, we do not do buffering on the published subscribe channel. Um, the published subscribe channel is always going to fire off directly to its handlers that are subscribed, either in the same thread or using task executor. Um, what you can do is have a buffering channel downstream from that. And we have this generic bridge component that you can connect any two channels. If you want to do buffering for one of the consumers but not for another, then you would add the bridge and a buffering channel um, for the one that needs it. <clears throat> the next question, any showcases around how to use integration with other server push technologies like Comet? Um, what we're doing there, actually, we do have something very similar to this in the Spring Blaze project. So you can register a flex destination, and on the server side, that's mapping by that destination name to a Spring integration message channel with the same name. And it makes it really easy to build um, push to a flex client, and then also to be able to do things like build a flex client that sends out a Twitter update or sends out an email or something by just changing what's on the other side of that channel on the server side. What we're going to be adding, though, in um, within the 2.1 timeframe, which is the next version, we're going to be adding a Comet um, Atmosphere Bio, some you know something that combines all of that as well as web sockets. Uh, Jeremy Grayley, who read who uh, leads the the Spring Blaze project and does a lot of work on the Spring MVC project in general as well as Spring JavaScript, he's actually um, already built and prototyped that. Um, right now it's using Atmosphere, and we're going to be um, uh, figuring out exactly what we're going to do for the 2.1 timeline. But you would be able to grab that from our sandbox very soon and play around with whatever version we have in place even before 2.1. The nice thing is that all of these adapters are completely isolated from the rest of the framework. So you can use something in the sandbox at your own will, even though we wouldn't recommend using sandbox code for the, for the core framework itself. But if it's something that is either you build it yourself or you use our sandbox or you modify our sandbox or maybe contribute back to our sandbox, sandbox project, we, um, we do recommend that. Okay, PubSub Hubbub, that's another one. We actually have, um, have looked into that, and I would just say uh, 
keep an eye out and see what, what comes out. I don't have any real concrete plans to describe. Um, examples are bundled with Spring Integration Download? No, not anymore. We actually split those out so that we could maintain a separate Git repository. Um, what we're doing is we're planning on tagging that Git repository with the version that it's compatible with so that you can go grab uh, 2.0 GA samples against the 2.0 GA framework. Um, but we just wanted to keep those separate for a number of reasons. It also is going to be an area that we want to maybe have more collaboration with the community in those samples themselves. <clears throat> so there was a recent blog I want to point out. If you want to look at the samples, I think it was on September 29th at blog.springsource.com. There was a really good introduction to how to get started with our samples. So, so check that out. Um, also, I just mentioned the 2.0 release. Our plan right now is to have 2.0 GA released tomorrow. Uh, it will definitely be out within the next few days for spring integration. Uh, the presentation and demo source that you see, uh, the presentation itself will be available at the uh, springsource.com slash webinars. And the demo sources, as I mentioned, um, are available through our Git repository. So git.springsource.org, and then look at spring integration, and underneath that we have a samples repository. So a couple people asked that question. Someone asked about the Rue add-on. Um, I'll just mention that we, we actually have two add-ons in the work. One is for you to configure your pipelines um, using the command line interface and building things at a, at a higher level where we'll stub it out so that you can just kind of fill out those pieces. The other add-on, which I think is going to be even more interesting, is for building adapters. So you would be able to use this add-on to create your own new adapter, and it's going to build a namespace for you. It's going to follow the same conventions that we have with packaging structure and everything else. Um, we're going to make that available so that hopefully we can have more community contributions and yet have consistency at the same time enforced by people using that add-on to build their adapters. So keep an eye out for that. We're hoping to get that out as soon as possible. Hopefully we'll have something that you can at least play around with in um, January. Okay, um, then just a few comments. Um, people liked the demo. Thank you. <laughs> uh, replicating master data via SOAP messages. I would recommend just looking at the Spring OXM library. Our adapter for that, that actually we have two different options. You can plug in an OXM marshalling transformer um, anywhere, even if you're not using SOAP. You can plug that in and do any XML transformation within your component. And then we have the um, the option of plugging the marshaller directly into your web service adapter. So when you plug that in, it will be invoked just like it would when you're using the Spring Web Services library itself. And you can use any of the marshalling uh, options that are supported, or you can customize them yourself. <coughs> okay, the next question is, how does it compare with Apache Camel? Which unfortunately is probably a much longer discussion than I can um, afford to go into right now in terms of the detail. I just want to point out probably the main difference is the, the extent to which we build on top of the Spring Framework. Um, really, this project evolved out of the Spring Framework. Hopefully, it's very clear from the, the, um, from the slides and the progression of the slides that all of our components are Spring lifecycle components. All of our threads are managed by Spring task executors. All of our transactions are managed by Spring's transaction management. And then everything that we build is as thin as it possibly can be, delegating to JMS template, REST template, web service template. If you're using REST template, then you're going to be familiar with the HTTP message converters. If you're using JMS template, you're going to be familiar with the message converters. And those are all the same strategies that we use. So I think that's really the, the main distinction. Um, there's much more to it at an API level. There are a lot more subjective things. There are um, the, the various adapters, and Camel does provide a lot of adapters and, and some things that we don't have either yet or uh, maybe won't have at all, but it just depends on what is contributed by the community and what is uh, being asked for by the community as well. Okay, so um, event processing combined with Spring MVC to support something like WebSockets. Again, there I would say uh, stay tuned to see what we actually do provide with WebSockets, but that is perfectly um, possible to build on top of what we have there today. Uh, you might want to get in touch with Jeremy directly and talk to him about what he's been doing. Um, and we'll try to publicize that more as soon as we can. Okay, I'm just looking through here. We, we need to kind of wrap it up, unfortunately. Um, so there, there are a couple questions about how you can how does it relate to an ESB? I'm just going to generalize because I see a few questions left in the queue. 
um, that are sort of related to ESBs, uh, integrating with ESBs, other uh, replacing an ESB. And I just want to point out that most uh, it's kind of a fact of life today that you, most companies are not going to be able to have this one ESB, um, you know, the, the goal of ESB is that there's this one broker and everything can use that. Instead, what we really need to accept is that integration is going to be between disparate systems that may be built by different teams. Maybe you're acquiring a new company and they've used something else. They're not going to rewrite it. So we tend to look at the common denominators like web services, JMS, and all of those things. There's no reason why you can't have multiple systems together, and there's no reason why you can't migrate from one to another if you really need to. Um, in terms of how Spring Integration stacks up against an ESB, we really try to emphasize that it is not an ESB. It's not trying to be an ESB. It can do, it can solve a lot of the same problems that an ESB does. But first and foremost, it's a messaging framework that can be embedded within an application context and just so happens to support endpoints, either inbound or outbound, from within that application context. But we like to think of it as a Spring application being extended into that um, into that enterprise integration domain model as opposed to being some server that you deploy your application into. Spring integration is just an extension of Spring. Anywhere you can run Spring, you can run Spring integration, and then that becomes your ESB if you want to call it that. Okay, so I think, unfortunately, we're going to um, have to stop there. Uh, just one last thing, because I do see two questions on performance. I'll just point out that um, the framework itself it is adding as little overhead as possible. So when it comes to performance, I would just recommend actually building a prototype and pumping your data through it, because it's going to depend on the machine you're running on and the data that's being passed in your message. When you send a message to a Spring Integration channel, it is literally going to call that channel's dispatcher, and that dispatcher is going to call the handler's handle method. And that's all that we're adding in terms of overhead on this channel. So two method calls and a stack not even an AOP proxy or anything, just literally two method calls on a stack. Uh, so it's a pretty um, general question, how does it perform? It really depends on, on the data that, that you're using and um, what, what different adapters that you're plugging in. So it sounds like I'm dodging the question, but that really is um, the truth. I think we should probably put out some benchmarks saying, here's the data that we've used, and here's the system that we ran it on, and this is the throughput that we've got. That's something that we'll try to do after we get the 2.0 release out um, and, and maybe write a blog on that, since people do ask the question a lot. Okay, so with that, I think I'm going to have to wrap it up. Thanks for joining, and don't forget, uh, it will all be available at springsource.com webinars. Thank you.